So who was there from last year? It's quite a bit of a difference, right? <laughs> so last year we had a hands-on uh, approach from pineapple pie. It was quite, I think we went through it. But OK, so I mean, thank you. Thanks a lot, Philip. Um, one of our goal with this workshop is that the same people who are actually designing these CRISPR screen and conducting them in the lab should be able to analyze their own data without waiting forever for a computational biologist or a bioinformatician to have time to look at it without even having the biological interests. Um, so that was the motivation behind uh, Pineapple Pie. This was the motivation behind setting it up as a web application. Um, Nevertheless, you might, and I'm going to leave that microphone. Um, you might be interested, actually, in going a little beyond um, uh, the, what the website is giving you and what the uh, pineapple pie is giving you and, and running your own analysis. And so this is the part that I would like to, to kind of teach you uh, tonight uh, for the next maybe 40 minutes. Um, you know, we're quite ahead of schedule. Um, and uh, this is going uh, to happen in the R Studio environment. So I don't know if uh, most of you are familiar with R. Can, can, can I, um, let me, who, who, who knows R? Okay, good. I mean, who has some notion of R? <laughs> um, so this is uh, one of my favorite environments to do the, the post analysis after those large, more computationally intensive analysis, such as read alignment. Uh, you end up with relatively small data set. They're still too big to be handled in an Excel sheet. So one of my goals as well is for um, uh, experimental biologists to move away from Excel and uh, try to scale up uh, their game a little bit by running some of these analyses in R. So let's see how that runs, because this is not a slide presentation here. It's an hands-on analysis. So uh, I would like uh, everybody to um, uh, run R Studio. And most of you uh, have installed it because it was in the instructions for the website. And I want this to be interactive, okay? So we're going to be also circulating with microphone. Uh, we, can, we can help you. So we're going to take a slow pace because uh, what's important is that you get a handle on a few of the packages that I would recommend to use this type of, uh, of data. And that uh, you can even go beyond analysis of CRISPR screen and any type of data you see in your lab, you may be able to to move away from Excel or Prism and, and consider using R. So uh, for those of you who were not in the, in the auditorium at 3, um, I recommended you download uh, this folder. This is on the GitHub repository of my lab. Uh, it's called um, the, so if you go to GitHub on GX, uh, the repository is called uh, Workshop CRISPR R. And to download it, you click on this uh, green button here. Um, so assuming you've done that or you're doing that right now, uh, the next step is to open the R Studio, and let's see um, how the resolution is here. Uh, I would like to maybe um, uh, do a more broader view. Um, is it is too small? Maybe yeah. Is there a way to increase the font? Hey, here you go. All right. So for those of you who are not familiar with R Studio, we've got a console here on the left-hand side. Uh, you've got your environment here on the uh, upper right-hand side, and you've got kind of the, the file uh, system uh, on the bottom uh, right-hand side. Uh, we're going to uh, make another uh, panel appear as we go and open one of the files that was located in the folder you just downloaded. Uh, so if you just uh, go to that folder, uh, open file, uh, currently I think it's mine is in the download folder, it's right here. Uh, and the file I would like you to open is called the rpractice.rmd. Uh, that's called um, uh, Markdown file. Um, so this is actually what's called a notebook. A notebook is a combination of text and blocks of code. So it will walk you through all the steps be, and commenting between each of the steps. There is actually a way, once you're finished with a notebook, there is a way to generate an HTML file corresponding to that notebook. You can see the corresponding HTML file is actually available in that same folder. Um, this is not the NB one, that's the, the big one here. And so, uh, okay, I don't know why it doesn't open it. But, oh, that's, sorry, I clicked the wrong one. See, it's too small. But you, you have the corresponding uh, HTML file that has you know, the blocks of code, 
uh, the figure and the table we will be generating. So if you want to have a sneak peek or don't want to run the analysis yourself, but just uh, you know have a look at what I'm talking about, uh, you can just browse that HTML file. Okay, let's go back to the R Studio. Uh, again, we have this uh, R notebook. I'm going to reduce this. Um, so we're going to walk through through it. So. In the first step, I recommend you install some packages that you will be uh, probably missing from the default installation of RStudio. So this is this first block of code. It's all commented out for now. That means it's inactive. And if you run the entire notebook, first run and run all, it's not going to run that. But I want to make sure you guys can all run this. So um, if you uncomment that particular line, uh, technically we could uh, uh, run the entire notebook right now. I suggest we only run that block of code just to make sure that everybody is on the same speed, on the same page, and all, all of you guys have the right package installed. What are those packages? I mean, you can see they are separated by commas here. Uh, they are packages to uh, manipulate data frames, um, stapler, tighter. Uh, they are packages to reshape uh, data frame from a compact version to a, a long version. There are packages to plot, like ggplot uh, or pheatmap, and some more statistical packages. Okay, so if you uncomment that line and you just run install packages, um, you can click yes, I want to update these. Uh, it should run. Um, all right, so that, that starts to be, be bad. Okay. Do you know? I don't want to restart R. Um, so it is downloading it. It's downloading, uncompressing, installing it. Okay. So at the end of this process, uh, you should have this the downloaded binary package are in, and it's good, should go in the uh, default folder. If you're having trouble, please raise your hand. And uh, uh, anybody uh, who knows R in my co-instructor can help. <laughs> um, okay, I can help. So we'll take it slow. Okay. If you want to go out, you're not interested. Can but. There's some interesting raffle coming up, so, and some science. We'll see how much I can do uh, on a one by one basis, but yeah. yeah, I'm still here. Okay, so download the, the folder by clicking on the red button, on the green button. Yeah, the green button. Okay, so it's just downloading the, the folder, yeah. So this, this should download it into your default download location in your Mac, OK? That was an easy one. All right, so once we have installed uh, these packages, um, who's having trouble installing them? Or just running that bit of code? Anyway, uh, there's another thing we, sh we should do, which is actually uh, going to the lower right panel, we're going to change, we're going to set our working environment. Um, so the working directory should be uh, um, the one in which we want to, uh, um, uh, the one we just downloaded. So if you can look here on the side, I'm not in the right location here. This is just my root location of my computer. So in order to move to that uh, just di directory that we just downloaded, you can just move to it here through this file system. And the folders are usually at the bottom, and here is my folder. OK, this is the folder I want to be in, OK? I have all my HTML, I have the, the file we just opened, and especially important, we have those two folders in which the input data is, OK? Um, this input data, so, OK, let, let's finish about this setting the folder. So once you move in this file system to that folder, I suggest you set as working directory. So you go to more and set as working directory. So now everything we're doing will happen in this uh, working directory, OK? Um, so again, let's browse a little bit the files that are put in these two folders. These are files that are really directly downloaded from the output of Pineapple Pi, OK? Once you go on Pineapple Pi, you download this big archive, you're going to see these files. The Pineapple Pi will put these files in separate folder for each uh, library or for each experiment. So the little trick I did here is that I copied them in the same folder. So that's it's easier for R to, to kind of find them and stitch them together. Um, so there's uh, a folder for the counts, which is the raw counts of every single GAD RNA. And then there's a folder for the result of this enrichment analysis, uh, which has, a, in addition to the normalized counts, the p-value, et cetera. Um, so uh, 
All right, so we have now installed the packages that we wanted. Now we're going to load them. So that's the second block of code. Second block of code, we load these packages. That should be trivial and fast. Uh, so now they're all available in our working environment, OK? Um, I move down. Again, I can comment on, on what I just said. Uh, um, uh, I just wrote. Uh, the experiment that I, I wanted to share with you is one of, of one of my own. Um, if you look in these folders again, you may see the different type of experiments. We have different results here. In fact, uh, the experiments I have, we have four replicates uh, per condition, and we have three conditions. One of the conditions is called the baseline. That's the, the, the baseline that uh, JP talked about, the one before, uh, just um, right after the pure mycin selection, actually. Um, so that's really before any selection has happened. Uh, another, and it's the, what we call the T0 here in this nomenclature. And the uh, two other condition is at T3, so a, a further time point in, in uh, the future, several weeks. Uh, one is T, which is treated. We treated these cells with a chemotherapy. And one is U, untreated. Okay? So again, three conditions and four, four replicate per condition. Those replicates are indicated by the, um, the, the name of these files. Uh, it's infection 1, replicate 1, infection 1, replicate 2, infection 2, replicate 1, infection 2, replicate 1. So this is a little bit of the biology background of my experiment. Um, the next uh, couple blocks of code are going to import uh, the count file. So this is a small function. Uh, you can try to decipher it, but otherwise you just re recycle the one I wrote. Uh, we first uh, teach R that um, this should be a function, so that shouldn't do anything except create a function in this uh, panel here. And the actual import will happen in the next block of code, which I run now. Uh, so this block of code gives the list of files to R and runs this function for each file in the list of files. Um, the result of this is actually uh, called a list. It's a list of data frames. So every single big table is a data frame, and uh, these data frames are put together in a list. Uh, a list is always a bit difficult to handle in R. I'd like an uh, even larger data frame if I can build them. So that's what the next block of code is doing. Uh, this block of code actually removes this list and combines all the data frame into one giant data frame. Just add a new variable now, which is the library name, um, which was part of the data frame in the first place. Okay, so here we are. We are now stitching back, stitching together all these data frames. So, how do I view my samples? So you can go on the upper left, upper right corner. Uh, you can see uh, the. Um, um, I have a bunch of. Um, let me let me actually redo that and make some uh, clean up a little bit this working environment. It's not really clean right now. Uh, sorry, I have some old project there. So let me rerun the few some the few steps I did. Please raise your hand, okay, if you're uh, a bit lost. Uh, again, I want this part to be a general teaching about R uh, more than just about the CRISPR screen. Do you have the latest R study? So if you cannot open the RMD, maybe you can open it in a text editor and then paste it in a new file. Can you do that? So if you have a trouble opening the RMD file, sometimes the fact that I upload it to the GitHub repository will actually change a bit the nature of this RMD file, and RStudio will not recognize it as a notebook. So the way to trick it is to go in a text editor, paste it, and copy it back into the, um, the RStudio environment. Yes? Oh, you don't have the, the panels? It doesn't look like our studio. It's called our GUI. So you got the wrong program. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. So, yeah, we, I, I propose our studio. There may be some other IDE. An IDE is an integrated development environment that could work for you. I'm just very used to our studio, and I think it's one of the better ones out there. So let's continue. Uh, if you don't mind. Okay, so how do you view now uh, the, the files that have been generated? Um, 
Um, so you, you can see here on this uh, upper right corner uh, the list uh, of um, um, the list of um, uh, file, uh, the list of um, objects, the list of objects that are in your environment. So you remember we have a function object that we did. We have this list of files. And now we have this new giant data frame that's called the count single guide. Okay, So that's the result of the aggregation of all the counts for all the 12 experiments that I have. So we can actually click on it. And the nice thing about the RStudio is that you can open that as a table. So again, uh, it's really, I did not uh, change much the output of um, of a pineapple pie. There's one colon is the single guard RNA name. The second colon is the gene name. Uh, the next colon is the count, the row count, not normalized. And then the last name is this library name. Well, it's not exactly the library name. It's the file name and all the paths to the file. So we'll make it a little prettier. And that's what the next block of code is doing. It's just text. Uh, use the function separate to kind of read through that string and remove the slash and pick the actual string that corresponds to the library name. Um, so you can see the structure of this separate. I specify the data frame, I specify which column I want to separate, and I specify the separator, which is either a dot or a slash. And then I specify what call new column I want to name these, uh, the result of this separation. And so uh, when you do that, it's going to run through this entire giant file. And now I'm having a, a much prettier name, at least under the library one, I'm having a much prettier name. So I can get rid of these other ones uh, that are empty or that have uh, unrele irrelevant information. In order to get rid of columns, I use this dplyr function that's called select. With a, um, and I select specifically the column I want. So again, the first member of this function is the name of the data frame. I select f columns from the count SG data frame. And which column do I select? The single guard RNA name, the gene name, the value of the count, and, and the library name. So, and we copy that back to the actual data frame that we want. So now we have a much cleaner data frame where we have all the information we need. As you notice, it's a pretty big data frame. You can't do that in Excel, or your computer will have a hard time. Okay, It's a, it's a table of four columns with 1.5 million rows. Um, and uh, uh, for for our, it's a piece of cake. Okay, uh, who's um, need a little more time? Should I slow down? Who's up to speed? Okay, we're doing fine. All right, um, we'll do another you know ten fifteen minutes of that, <laughs> and uh, and then we're gonna uh, actually uh, have some scientific talks. Another problem there. Okay, what is it? Way behind me. Okay. How much time do you need? That's okay. I'm sure some other people are happy, are happy that I'm stopping a little bit.
Uh, any other issue? So some people uh, forgot to uncomment the installation step. So that means they didn't have any of the package installed. So again, you probably did not install the, the function. Oh, it worked? It works. That's probably a problem. Yeah, so if, you, if your um, error is cannot find a function separate, because that's kind of the first function that we call from one of the package that we installed, that means that uh, the installation step didn't run through, didn't go through. Yeah, that's good. That, 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 yeah, the, the import count, the, the block with the import count doesn't do anything. It just creates a function. So then you need to run the next block. Yeah, so where you use the function. Okay. So you don't have a problem, Tyler. I do. I got it. it says uh, the separate function doesn't work. What did you need a... um, it's a version of the package. Did you install the package? Mm -hmm. Can you just specify? You're comfortable doing that? Yeah. Oh, that'd be great, yeah. So some people are having problems. I had a big mistake last time. I think it was a version. It might be. My install log looked a little different, so. Who's having a problem with a separate function? I think there's one problem over there. Thank you. I've got a nice volunteer. So if this separate function doesn't work, don't worry too much about it, OK? That means your library name will be a little funky with a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of other character in it, OK? But don't worry too much about it. So what else we, do we do? I mean, we're still in the preparation step here, but we have now finished that step, OK? So let's start computing a few of the statistics and normalization. So um, as I mentioned, um, uh, this is uh, the unnormalized count. So um, if you read uh, the manual of the dplyr package, the dplyr package has a lot of function to filter columns, uh, select column, uh, group by factors. And the beauty of this dplyr package is that a function like has a pipe, meaning you can take the output of one function and pipe it into the next function and pipe it into the next function. So that's what the syntax of this next block looks like. You first take, and I'm looking at the block that's here, um, you first take your data frame, okay, um, and you first tell uh, dplyr and r that you want to uh, first made a grouping by library, because we're going to compute things that are library specific or sample specific. So we specify the variable by which we want to group. And the little piping character is percent greater than percent. Okay, that's, that's a, just a meta character, don't mess it up. You have a space percent greater than percent space. And that's your pipe in the dplyr syntax. So we pipe counts SG, our data frame, into this grouping. So we just tell to group by library. The next variable and the next function is summarize. So that means we're going to create now uh, some summary variable. OK, and I have a question here, so I'll be right back. You can run the, the block and see the results and figure out if you understand the code. You're ahead of me. So you're ahead of me. I haven't done that. But yeah, it looks good. It looks good. Um, so the summary, summarize function will allow you to create now new variable that does, um, that are the, in which you put the result of a mathematical operation. Okay? So here I'm introducing actually more than one new variable. At first I'm introducing total. 
so total will take just the total number of reads that are in each library. That means I'm going to sum up this count column across the entire library. Okay, so that's the sum of the variable value. Okay, I'm going to create um, another uh, uh, variable. This is the total number of single gather in it. And if you learn your lesson about the Gecko version 2, you, see, you should see 123,000. But the way to summarize that number of single gather in, so the number of unique uh, single gather in, is just going to be the length of that data frame, pretty much. So that's the length of, you could have picked another of the variable, but I picked the variable value. You could have said length of single gather in or some, some other one. Um, the next one is a little more uh, uh, interesting, um, which is the uh, number of single gathering that are covered in our library. So what, what does that mean covered? That means they receive a, a number of reads that are greater than zero. Uh, and in order to calculate that, we calculate the length of a vector. And this vector is uh, uh, a vector that's determined by all the values that have a value greater than zero. And that's the syntax to calculate that. And finally, uh, in order to be even more uh, 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 relevant, uh, we calculate the fraction of single gut RNA that are covered. So for this, we just take the same syntax as before, the length of the vector uh, of value that are greater than zero, and we divide it by the length of the value. Okay, so if you run that piece of code, um, so you, we put the result of this in a, in a variable that's called, in a, an object that's called total count, and then we just call total count to display it. So this notebook allows you to display a few of the, the first few rows, but you can really scroll through it. Uh, we have 12 rows because we have 12 samples in our library. Okay, so everybody understand the... So as you can tell already, uh, every library was sequenced at a, at a different depth, okay? We have a library that was sequenced uh, at 7.2 million, uh, and that's the minimal, at least in this panel. And we have another library that was sequenced at, one, uh, at 18 million, okay? So that's where you uh, realize you need to normalize for the total number of reads that you generated, because Kristen is really good, but she's never going to be able to sequence the exact same number of reads from all your libraries, okay? So, or you're, or you're really bad at pooling your library because sometimes she doesn't pool, you pool. And so, uh, in any case, we need to correct for that. So the way to do that, again, we're going to use this magic uh, piping from uh, Deplier. And that's the next block of code, where this time we take the data frame, we group by library, again, grouping by, by our samples. And then we're going to create a new variable, this time using the function mutate. Uh, um, and mutate, we're going to create a new variable that's called RPM. I think uh, Philip calls it CPM, count per million or read per million, which is pretty much uh, um, the value of the count for each single gathering divided by the sum total of all the values, by the total coverage. Okay, And we multiply by 1 million in order to get the PM, the per million. Um, so that's the normalization. So again, Pineapple Pi does normalization, so we could have started directly from the normalized file, but this is a way to teach you how to actually normalize this type of data. Okay, so we, the next block is uh, now another kind of summary block. So the difference between summarize and mutate, mutate, you create a new variable for each um, row of your input data frame. Summarize, you're going to create a variable, but that's for an aggregation type of function. You want to aggregate a number, a, math, a mathematical formula, or um, according to another variable, the grouping variable. So that was the difference between summarize. And again, there's a great tutorial about Deplier. Uh, great tutorial about Deplier, so you don't have to uh, listen to me too much. Um, and so we just verify that now uh, the total number of uh, reads when you sum up all the RPM is 1 million. So we normalized all these libraries so they are now comparable to each other. OK, so let's do a little bit of plotting now that we have normalized our counts. Um, so we'll take it slow. Um, we are going to focus first on one of the library. Okay, We're going to plot the distribution of normalized count in one of the libraries. So the way to do that, we're going to create a new data frame, a smaller data frame, that's the C1 data frame. That's just the result of um, uh, filtering these 
giant data frame for the library that has the name um, i1r1 t0 underscore 1. Um, so that's the first replicate of the baseline uh, of the of the baseline uh, time point of the baseline condition. So we have created now the C1 data frame. Uh, you, we can look at it if you want. You just click on it. It's it's now now we have a new column, this RPM column, and we have all this single gate RNA. And let's plot this uh, C1 data frame. So in order to plot, I encourage you to learn the package ggplot2. It's really flexible uh, plotting. A lot of the nice uh, plot you see in a lot of the papers have been generated with ggplot2. It has this characteristic gray background. So every time you see a figure with this gray background, uh, it's ggplot2. You can modify it. You can remove the gray background if you want. But the default is the gray background. And ggplot function. Um, in, in, uh, there's two uh, sides of this function. You first specify with the ggplot function what is your data frame, C1, and what are the variables that you use for aesthetic, AES, aesthetic. So uh, one of the variables we want to use is the RPM. We want to plot the RPM, the distribution of RPM. Well, actually, I changed it a little bit here. The RPM is pretty unevenly distributed. You've got a lot of low um, a read per million, a lot of low coverage, and a few, very few high coverage. So we plot actually the log 10 of the RPM. But in order to not miss on the one that have a zero coverage, I add a small number, 0 0.01. I just make sure that that number is lower than the minimal number of RPM. So this way, uh, anything that's in the log 10 is uh, minus 2 will actually be my zeros in the distribution. So that was the first term of that ggplot function. But we haven't told ggplot what type of plotting we want to do. So after that, you can specify many type of plot. You can specify bar chart. You can specify a box plot. The one I like to plot for distribution is called the cumulative distribution function. And so this is the function stat ecdf. So once you plot that, it's actually very similar to this Lorentz curve that pineapple pie generates. So um, the, the axes are, are kind of flipped, but it's very similar to this uh, um, um, Lorentz curve. The way you interpret this particular plot, the y-axis is in fact the fraction of single GAD RNA in your library. So you got 123,000 single GAD RNA. So you pretty much have 50% of your single GAD RNA that have a coverage of 10 or less, OK? So log 10 equals 1 or less. So this is the way to look at this distribution. Now we can, with this, we can modify a little bit the ggplot function. We can add a few elements to make it pretty. We can add a label for x-axis, a label for y-axis. We can change the font size. And there's lots of options, again, that you can learn online by learning Dplyr. And so once you do that, you can now have bigger font. You can have a nice. Uh, label, and you can almost publish that. You can always export that plot if you want uh, by um, um, just right click. Uh, you can export it uh, and paste it in your PowerPoint. Or I guess you can also download it or something like that. If you right click it, you can always download it. Um, OK. So all right, so we did it for one library. Now, wouldn't it be cool to use that plot to compare the distribution between all our 12 libraries? So uh, ggplot is actually extremely powerful to do that. It's a little bit like Prism. You don't have to actually plot 12 individual plots. Uh, the way you specify that is to add another aesthetic variable. So again, very similar function than the one before. But this time, our data frame is the count SG, the entire data frame. And the aesthetic, uh, in the aesthetic uh, parameters, we added the color equal library. Color equal library, that means it's going to take a library as one of those parameters, and it's going to plot a different color for each library. But it's going to do the exact same plot for each of them. And then the rest is exactly the same. So you specify your grouping variable again with the color um, for the type of, and then you can, and then you obtain uh, this community distribution for all 12 libraries. So you can compare already, if you're good at distinguishing all those rainbow colors, you can compare already uh, which one, the baseline, which are really nice and and almost like a step function from the treated one, like the green one, that already show quite some bias. A lot of single gather RNA are lost, and a few are enriched. Okay, um, 
this is not the most convenient way to look at, at this because 12 different colors in a plot is not great. So ggplot can also uh, plot one type per panel. So that would be quite useful. For example, we could have one panel where we are all four untreated replicate, one panel where we are all four baseline. So in order to do that, we need to add another um, column in our data frame that indicate what type of library it was. Is it baseline, is it treated, or is it untreated? Right now, the only column that does kind of that is the library name, but that's not sufficient. So in order to do that, uh, this is what the next block of code does. We introduce now another variable using the mutate function. This variable is called type. And type, uh, in order to determine the type, I'm just going to interpret the string of the name, OK? This, that's what this if else grep l uh, does. Grep l tests uh, whether the string t0 is present in my library name. If it is present, I call that baseline. If it is not present, I call that t3. The next step is going to look whether the t3 underscore t is present in my library name. If it is, it's going to call it treated t3. Otherwise, it's just going to keep the type. So it's going to keep baseline for baseline and t3 for untreated. And then the last one is about the untreated. If I see the string t3 underscore u, it's going to be untreated. And then otherwise, I'm keeping type. OK? So that's one way to add a new variable now that's derived from the library name. And so now if I go back to my count, we can see that um, this now type is baseline. And if I scroll down, I can see that the, uh, the other libraries will have treated or untreated. So now that's great. Because now that gives me another plotting variable, this type of library. So now I can tell ggplot, I can separate those panels. And I can have one panel for baseline and one panel for treated and another panel for untreated. Um, I'm going to skip that block. I think that block is only uh, just, that was a kind of sanity check, verifying that I assigned the right type to the right library by just uh, selecting those two columns, library and type, and determining if they fit together. So I can verify that treated is really treated, etc. So then the next plotting function is now adding very much the same thing, but the last term at the bottom line is this called face it wrap. So it's going to face set this in multiple panel. And the variable according to which you want to face it is called type. And you need this little tilde before, because um, you can specify columns versus row if you want. So you could have one variable that distinguishes in column and another variable in rows. Right now, we only have one variable, so we just use the right-hand term of that tilde equation. And we can specify how many columns we want. And so we can just rerun that. It's a lot of data. But now, the exact same plot we had all on one single panel are displayed in three different panels, baseline, treated, untreated. Makes it a little more easy to run. OK. Who's totally lost? <laughs> OK. I'll take a two-minute break, but I think, I think we covered quite a bit already. So it was just a... Uh, yeah, if you didn't have the latest R Studio version or the latest package, you may run into little issues. But hopefully most of you are up to speed. OK, so two more minutes, and then we're going to have Ryan present some of his results. Um, so the next uh, uh, new type of data I would like to compute, in addition to the total number of reads and the normalized number of reads, uh, is this Gini index. So again, Pineapple Pie gives you that Gini index, but if, what if you wanted to calculate it yourself? Um, well, you can uh, use, again, this nice dplyr piping uh, strategy where you start with your data frame, the count SG. You group by library and by type this time. And, uh, 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 and you, can, you can summarize. Well, you don't need to group by type, actually. You could have used only library. But then you, you, you use that function from the inec package that's called the inec function, and you specify that it's a genie 
um, you want to use the Gini uh, uh, method, the Gini method for that function. If you don't know how a function works or what is this syntax, there's always a, a help menu, okay? So if I want to know how the inec function works, you can go in the lower right panel and type this inec, and then you have a direct uh, view of the manual. So inec takes this and the different methods are Gini, RS, Square, Entropy, etc. And it really describes how to use it. So here is how I use it. I do the Gini on the RPM and here are my Gini indexes. So we got a table, this is nice. Uh, we can put that in Excel and do a plot in Excel or we can use ggplot to plot that. And in order to see that there is actually a, um, um, a significant uh, um, a selection happening. So if I now take the result of that Gini computation, because I put the result into a new object that's called a Gini data, this is the Gini data frame, uh, and it should have appeared here on the upper right side. I have all my Gini things. How do I plot that into a ggplot? I can specify ggplot. Again, I want to ggplot the Gini data frame. Uh, what are the uh, aesthetic? Uh, I want my x-axis to be the different libraries, so it's library. I want the y-axis. This time we need to specify y-axis. It's called Gini. I want to have each type of library to be a different color. I would like to distinguish for visual aesthetic. And the type of plotting I want to do is a geom bar. But ggplot is so powerful that you can uh, even run some uh, aggregation statistics if you don't specify. But right now, we don't need anything. The number we have in our table, this 0.98 Gini, is the number we have on our bar, OK? So in order to let ggplot do that, you need to specify uh, to use just the identical value in your uh, um, data frame for the statistics. So it is the stat equal identity. So that's a very spe specific way to run a bar chart. Uh, and the other um, um, fields are familiar to you now. And uh, these are my Gini plot, okay, my Gini value. So there's a few things that look ugly on there. Uh, first, all the x-axis is uh, all intermingled together. Plus, my uh, libraries are not sorted by type, which is a little annoying. So you can actually modify that. In order to modify and make sure your libraries are plotted in the order you want, you need this little piece of code, which is you change, you specify the level of these library strings. You want to tell R, no, no, this name sh should go first and this name should go next. So you really do one by one, say, okay, this is the level and please modify my library parameter so that I can now plot them in the right order. You can also rotate the label on the, uh, sorry, I didn't run that, so I'm going to run that. So I changed the label. And you can now rotate the x-axis. And so by 45 degrees, and then you have a much nicer plot. And you can really see that this Gini index increases as you select the sample. So there's a little bit of increase between the baseline and the untreated. But you really see a strong increase uh, in the treated samples. That's what you wanted. And I think I'm going to stop here, but I hope that in this past 30 minutes, I gave you enough background about this particular notebook and the way I wrote it. And I hope there's enough comments in there so that you can walk down your way, because there's a lot more uh, plotting and statistics that I present, how to do a principal component analysis in there, how to perform a, a heat map and clustering that hopefully you will be able to take and use it for your screen or use it for your next uh, microarray uh, project. Um, so hopefully this, this was useful to, to you guys.